Hi guys, thanks for sticking around for us. Um, so we're gonna talk about autonomous vehicles, which I'm really excited about. Um, maybe we can start off, will you raise your hand if you know what the auto ISAC is? Okay, so like five people, which is more than I thought. Faye, do you wanna explain to everyone what it is that you do and what your organization is? Sure, and ISAC is an information sharing and analysis center, and it was a model that was based around public-private sharing of information. So working together across critical infrastructure, working with the government to share threat intelligence. And, and the intelligence included cyber, physical, and all hazards. So if you think of uh, like a hurricane, for instance, that could take out the grid, you'd want to be able to coordinate and to communicate and work with the government to ensure that gets back up and running. In this particular space, what we're doing in automotive is 14 OEMs came together and decided that it was really important as the shift is happening uh, in automotive to autonomy vehicles and more and more technology, that it was important that they come together and start sharing threats and vulnerabilities. And so that's what happened. They established the ISAC in 2014 in August. Uh, I think it was August, is that right? Yeah, so, towards the end of the year. Yeah, towards the end of the year, and they got up and running. I joined a year ago. In fact, today is my year anniversary for joining the organization. <laughs> so I made one year. I came out of aviation. I actually had done something very similar in aviation, and believe it or not, aviation is very similar to automotive, so it's been a really great journey for me. Um, but the uh, um, OEMs brought it together, that's the original equipment manufacturers. They then opened that up to the suppliers, so the supply chain's in. We've opened it up to heavy duty vehicles, so it's light and heavy duty, which includes trucks, fleets, and carriers. Um, so kind of like just a, it's sort of like a, like a threat sharing center for all of the players, the big players in the automotive industry. Um, and I, I feel like automotive and security are still kind of getting to know each other. They're not really sure what to think of each other yet. Um, can you maybe, Kevin, tell us a little bit just about the state of security in the automotive space? What's the attack surface that you're thinking about? Yeah, sure, no, it's a great question. Um, I, I think we're definitely still trying to you know, get to know each other because you know, security is a, a journey, it's a pathway. And uh, you know, we set out several years ago now at GM to really kind of re remake how we look at vehicles and, and drive security into that process. Um, you know, if you look at a modern car, and most of you guys probably drive a car, maybe not necessarily as many here as in Detroit, but um, you'd see Wi-Fi interfaces, Bluetooth for your phone, uh, USB ports for your phone and music. And that's probably in most of your cars. And then as you start to see new features with telematic systems, um, long range, you know, 4G, obviously 5G in the future, uh, those are all potential attack paths, you know, into, into our platform. And so it really, you know, the industry has realized that, hey, this technology is on the car. Some of the uh, underlying technology in the vehicle platform hasn't changed for, you know, decades. So we realize that those things have to change. And so uh, as a result, the industry is you know, forming things like the ISAC and doing other efforts, whether it's with the SAE, which is the S uh, Society of Automotive Engineers, or ISO, uh, developing new standards, and then working quickly to really understand what the threats are and then you know, work on controls as well. So how do we change the network strategies? How do we uh, make sure that the endpoints are secure? All those sort of things. Awesome, yeah, I think, I, I think about it in terms of uh, gadgets, because that's a lot of what I write about. But, you know, I wonder how the automotive industry is going to kind of avoid getting into the Android ecosystem problem, where they have different vulnerabilities and different OEMs, you know, a problem with the chip here or something else there. Um, how do you kind of bring all of that supply chain into the security process and, like, make sure that all of that is safe? I, I can start. <laughs> and obviously, the ISAC plays a role in that. Um, it is, it's tough, it's complicated, and you know, if you see new cars, uh, we, we want the new whiz -bang features in the car as well, and you know, the customers are demanding that. So uh, there's gonna be technology in the cars, and I don't think that's gonna go away. As we go to AV, you know, there's more and more software and more technology there. Um, really what it goes back to is, is making sure you have a risk-based approach and you're looking at security from the start. Um, and the, the, everything from, uh, putting it into your process to having contracts with your suppliers so that they're working uh, security in, in their house and in the products that they're delivering to you. 
And that, then you have security controls across the ecosystem. So looking at the threats, looking at you know, where you might have high-risk software, and then you know, what security controls do you put to try to protect that? Or how can you update it and patch it um, like you might see on your phone today? So all those sort of things are in play right now. So our mission space in the Auto ISAC is really crowdsourcing. It's kind of like a lot of what you're doing here, right? And talking about what are the vulnerabilities? Ha has anyone discovered something? Not the specific design or intellectual property, of course, but maybe the vulnerability that maybe it may affect one supplier, but that supplier may be supplying to multiple different OEMs or others, right? So it's really important that we work that together quickly. Um, and if we have a mitigation technique, we can do that. And part of the ISEC's role is to anonymize that information. So not everyone wants to be um, identified as having identified this. So we do that in such a way that in the ISAC that we can actually anonymize it. It's part of the role we play. Uh, and that does help to get some more information out there. We so, also- Sorry, want, is that protecting the identity of the researcher that finds a bug, or is that protecting the identity of a company that's affected by a bug, or both? Both. Okay. <laughs> so it could be the company doesn't want them to be out there, right? They don't want their name out there, clearly. A researcher could come forward who may not want to also be identified. We encourage and we accept any information coming in, even from outside of our membership. So we do encourage folks to come forward. And if they want to identify or self-attribute, that's great. If they have a mitigation technique, that's great. If not, we try to crowdsource, understand what the mitigation techniques might be, try to prepare some analysis on that, and then it goes back out as the ISAC um, document that, that the other members can use and help to secure. Got it. So how do you introduce the concept of cybersecurity to some of these industries like aviation or automotive that maybe haven't spent as much time thinking about it? Thinking about vulnerability detection or disclosures, yeah, they, they, they haven't. They, they are not used to having outside folks come inside, right? It's just not a natural act, as I like to say. Um, and so it is a different culture shift for them. It's difficult, and I think part of this, um, having the ISAC helps in, in some ways, although we really encourage, particularly security researchers, and each company to do their vulnerability disclosures because they have the specific knowledge of their own designs and so forth. But we have a mechanism so that we can help if there is a need. Yeah, and it, it's, um, it's a culture change. I think it was mentioned earlier, um, I think in the US government, right? You know, they're, they're trying to change the culture and uh, security has that unique way of doing that. And I, and I, I see it similar in my role is, uh, you know, we're in, you know, big old GM, right? But uh, if you think about some of the stuff that we're doing with autonomous vehicles and connected services, it's leading edge. And you can't do that without great software development as well as security. And so, um, you know, as you start to bring those people into your organization and your leadership understands what your mission is and what you're trying to do and what you're trying to change, you know, to become, uh, security has to be a top-down activity as it is at GM. So. We created this organization under Mary Barr, our CEO, and she, you know, she's voiced over and over again that security is a great importance to the company, along with safety. Um, and so, along with that comes, you know, new people that have new v views of how to really work, and then how to bring in third parties and other people um, that have different, diverse viewpoints. Because I can't hire everyone, you know, that knows. Um, a little bit about every single thing in my ecosystem. There's going to be people outside the company, people in this room that we need to learn from. And so being able to embrace that and, and having our leadership support that is, is a huge part of it. What kind of, kind of cultural differences or roadblocks did you run into when you were trying to set up the vulnerability disclosure program at GM? Yeah, uh, great question. So um, we knew early on we wanted to do a program, but it was one of the, the issues of uh, we wanted to make sure we were ready, and I think it was voiced here earlier several times that the last thing you want to do is launch a program and not be ready for it. Um, so we spent some time to get our feet under us and make sure that we have a staff and uh, that we could triage issues, that our IT organization was ready for, our, for the influx on that side. We were ready from a product side. Uh, and then you know, we looked around and, and tried to figure out, and this goes back you know, about two years ago, um, what's the right avenue for us? And you know, we ultimately decided on HackerOne because of the great platform and, and the community that already existed. And so we launched and, and we've had a, a public program here for almost two years and it's been a great learning experience. So you know, we, we had to have some capability to kind of weather that those early days of, you know, okay, what are we doing guys? But 
um, it's, it's kind of taken us to the next level. And then from here, you know, we're going to continue to mature that program and look at other options as well uh, to continue uh, getting focus on the vehicle, which is somewhat of a unique skill set. Yeah, I think, you know, the vehicles present a really exciting hacking challenge, uh, maybe a scary hacking challenge. And I think there's this, um, there's this balance between keeping a vehicle secure and also letting people in to kind of tinker and play and explore. Um, I'm really excited to, to write the blog when someone turns a tow truck into a Faraday cage and snatches one of these things. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I'm curious how you think about um, physical security, whether you want to let researchers come in and mess with a car and take it apart, um, or you know, whether you want that to be kind of, um, like how you want to isolate certain things in a vehicle to keep them safe. Yeah, I guess the way I'd answer that for now is, um, and it'll, it'll probably change over time. And I know there's there's a view, and it's a little theoretical, but I think it's a good one that um, if it's, if your software is completely open, it's going to be the most secure that it can be. And I and I get that. Um, I think some of the the traditional industries like automotive, you know, we're still trying to get down that continuum towards you know total openness. Um, and I think some of the things like having our vulnerability program is a step in that in that progression. Um, one thing that we're trying to do, because the barrier to entry is high, because you have to go buy a car and they're expensive, and uh, you don't necessarily want to hack your car and break it either. So uh, <clears throat> there's things that we're, we're looking at doing, maybe even as a part of a, pr a private program, where we create like a small subsystem where someone could go work on it in their in a, at their house or something like that, and look at an infotainment system or something like that as a way to break down that barrier. So that's an option. Uh, but, you know, we still do a lot of our full vehicle work, you know, in-house with third parties, and, and we, a lot of that's for safety reasons, right? We want to be at our proving grounds, so if something goes wrong, uh, we're in a safe environment, so. Yeah. Well, you heard a lot earlier today about the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, and I kind of wanted to mention also the uh, DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Um, Faye, maybe you can talk about how the ISAC is approaching the right to repair and whether or not you'll let people tinker with their cars and mess with them? Well, we, we in the ISAC are not a policy shop, so we don't make that policy. So I really need to defer on that one. We, we certainly um, you know, are here to help the automotive industry work together, but policy we don't comment on, sorry. Yeah. And, and I'm an engineer, so. Um, <laughs> but so, so right to repair is, uh, it's an interesting one, and if you guys aren't familiar with that, basically what it is is, um, I, I'm not even going to explain what it is. It, it was a letter that was signed, a memorandum of understanding with the state of Massachusetts that have been, has basically said across the United States, uh, the OEMs are going to keep their systems open for serviceability by third parties, essentially, if that means anything. And so... Um, what that means is our systems have to be open to a certain degree for independent servicers and, and, and the like. Um, what that means to me from a cybersecurity perspective is I have to understand how to provide uh, service techniques that are safe and secure for anyone, not just a small, uh, you know, a select group of people. And so a lot of that, um, at times you start having to maybe throw out traditional security controls because it's, you know, it, it, a key is only as good as a key. And if I have to give a key to every single person in this room to my front door, I haven't really done much to secure my house. So uh, you get into a lot of different ways of isolating systems and putting rationality around systems so that uh, you can only do things in certain physical environments and, and the like. So um, it's a challenging space, but you know we're fully committed to right to repair from a, a business perspective, and so that's helping to kind of drive our cybersecurity strategy. Well, that's good to hear. Um, I think that you know um, there's a lot of legislative efforts, policy efforts coming out now as autonomous vehicles are sort of becoming a reality that we're facing. You know, uh, the NIST guidance that came out earlier this year. I think the House just passed their Self Drive Act or Self Driving Act. Um, what are some of the concerns about legislation on autonomous vehicles. I know you want things to stay kind of open, right? So that people can, um, manufacturers can chart their own course. Yeah, another policy question. <laughs> Sorry, um, Faye. I play one on TV, though. So, um, well, I think, you know, we talked about this earlier, actually. And you were telling me that, you yeah. know, that, um, that you want automakers to have their independence, right? And to be able to... Well, and, and with the, the bills that are going through, um, a lot of what they're really trying to do is create an open framework because without rapid innovation, you know, we're not going to see the, the advancement in autonomous like we all want to see and expect. You know, we've got cars running around here in the city, 
uh, that are phenomenal. But if we get restricted by regulation early on, it's going to slow everything down, right? So we want to have uh, safe, uh, safe regulation to kind of enable the quick, quick churn uh, evolution of the technology, and then you know put put the right regulation and controls in place at the time you know when, when it's necessary to make sure that we're all safe. But if we don't allow the automakers to get there in a reasonable amount of time, it'll it'll slow things down. So. And Faye, we were talking before about um, competitive advantage and how some of these security issues, you know, a company might want to withhold that or not tell other people so that they can kind of get ahead. Um, how do you handle that within the ISAC and how do you deal with the competition in this space? Well, we think that security should not be a, dis a competitive advantage, right? So we really all need to work together. And I like to give the example from aviation where we learned through 9-11 that security really is not something that you, you really fool around with, right? You really come together and you want to crowdsource that information. And so if you think about protecting the whole of the industry, it's really an important paradigm. And it is difficult because we all are comp competing, right? Uh, but as I tell people, when the four Boeing aircraft went into the buildings and, and down, um, Boeing was sued, but you know, Airbus had as much of an impact on their, on their manufacturing and on their company as, as Boeing did, right? So the whole industry can go down if we don't do this right. Uh, you know, going back to the vulnerability disclosures, you know, we want to do this in a way that we help the industry learn. Uh, we talked a little bit about how do you do that? How do you make sure that we can do this and all learn from each other, right? So that's really the idea of what we want to do here and ensuring that we don't try to compete, but we try to work together and learn more. Yeah, and you've brought researchers into the ISAC, right, to kind of talk these automakers through. Um, what has that process been like? What has some of the reaction been? So we have a strategic partner program. So, look, for instance, security researchers would not be eligible to be a member, but they could be a strategic partner. HackerOne is a strategic partner. And what we can do is work together with you to understand what you have and what you want to share. And we will help to ensure that we communicate it to the right focals. One of the things that happened in aviation is we had a security researcher who claimed he tried to get through to uh, a company. He couldn't get through to them, so he sort of went to the, to the news. And that became pretty dramatic, right? And at the end of the day, he got himself hurt by doing that. Um, unfortunately, he was, um, you know, visited by the FBI, kind of like Sammy's story. And what we want to do is make sure that we work together in a meaningful way. And sometimes that requires just discrete communications. So we are open as the ISAC to hear from anybody if you want to get in touch. And I'll give you an example of one. So last, well, this February at RSA, Kaspersky researchers had come up with an Android vulnerability that impacted many vehicles. Actually, it impacted everything because the vulnerability was on the Android, depending on the application in the, in the vehicles. So we worked with the Kaspersky researchers. They came forward uh, and worked with us. We signed a non-disclosure agreement. They shared the details before they actually published and presented in public. We, we had them disclose one-on-one uh, -on -one to the different uh, OEMs that were affected. We then shared that across the industry for our, all of our memberships. Uh, it was really quite a win-win uh, situation for both the security researchers as well as our members. So that's what we strive for. Um, so one of the things that I've noticed about the automotive industry right now is there's a lot of vulnerability disclosure program, but there's not as much bug bounty, so folks aren't getting paid. Um, Kevin, do you think that's changing? Do you think that like, that money is coming? Is that tap going to turn on for us? Yeah, I think it will. Um, you know, with, with the scope as big as automotive and, and General Motors, um, I, I think the first step is, first of all, obviously building a program so that you can actually deal with vulnerabilities when they come in. And then you know, start a program is really just a vulnerability disclosure program so that you can start understanding who's out there, who, you know, what, what kind of information do they have, and what does that experience feel like? And that really helps you hone your processes. And now we've been doing that for, for almost two years now. And so um, we're at the stage now of, of defining the next step, which will probably be some sort of a private program that uh, lets us look deeper at a, a, spe a specific vehicle system, um, but probably with a bug bounty. So you know, I'm not going to announce anything official here, but um, you know, I think you'll see that in the future. So.
What about for you, Faye? Do you think that there's going to be a bug bounty component in the ISAC at any point? Well, probably not, because really this should be going to the specific um, product developers, right? So we wouldn't have the staff to be able to really manage that, but we certainly would be willing to connect people, right? So if there is someone that has something that they're interested in doing and sharing, we can make sure those connections are made. Um, you know, actually there was some discussion at, on the Hill about the ISAC becoming a vulnerability disclosure program. The challenge with that is I don't know his design. I don't have staff that know his design. So it really needs to be in the hands of the OEM, don't you agree? Yeah, you no, know, I agree. And uh, if you think about the ISAC, it's really uh, threat sharing and intelligence. So that informs kind of one side of the business and then vulnerability disclosure is another side of the business really. And so um, as things come into us, whether it's through uh, the, the platform or it's our own red team testing or other third parties, uh, as those vulnerabilities come in through our system, you know, we have to work with our engineering staff and then a lot of times our supply base uh, because oftentimes it's our suppliers that are developing the software and the hardware. And so those are very detailed conversations that we have to work with our suppliers to figure out, you know, is this truly a vulnerability? Uh, just because something is out there, it doesn't necessarily mean it's been implemented in an embedded system in the same way that it would in an IT system and whether it has the same amount of risk. So we have to look at them all uh, uniquely and, and with those uh, dedicated, um, you know, skills. Uh, and then if we find something that maybe could propagate to the broader industry, then that's where we go back to the ISAC and say, here's something that we found. Um, you know, here's how we're approaching it. You guys should look in your systems as well. Well, one more point on the, on the vulnerability disclosure program I think is really important. As I mentioned about the strategic partnership program, um, being able to work together with like a hacker one, it, we're really on a journey of discovery and learning, right? So one of the things we were, Tim and I have been talking about is how do we help to educate the community? Because some of this is about education. You know, some of the organizations aren't as mature as, say, GM. So we want to be able to really help them understand what does a program like this look like? What are the pros and the cons of doing a vulnerability disclosure versus a bug bounty? What does that look like? What kind of staff do you need? And, and, and the reason we want to give them some guidance and some educational material is that many of these organizations aren't quite ready for this. And uh, I'll give you an example in aviation. Um, one, of the, one of my favorite airlines, I won't mention which one, decided that, uh, you know, overnight, they were going to do a bug bounty program. And they announced it and, and then told us a little bit later. And I was kind of surprised. I said, well, gee, because I sort of know, knew the organization and I knew their staffing. And I said, do you guys really, are, are you really think you're ready for this? Oh, yeah, Faye, we're ready. Well, about a month later. <laughs> Uh, they realized they weren't ready for that. And that's okay. They learned a lot, right? It was an incredible experience for them. They were really happy, ultimately, that they had done it. But it was really quite dramatic for them, and they really had a big turnover because of that. Um, but they learned a lot. And one of the things that we learned through that experience was that you really do need to help educate folks because you can be inundated with information. And if you don't have folks on the other side to deal with that, to adjudicate it, to handle, to do have a process, then you can be in some, some you know, deep kimchi in a company. Yeah, and I think, you know, you're talking about educating the community, and I think that kind of goes both ways, right? Like, we were talking about how expensive it is to get into car hacking. You know, it's not like I can just go out and you know, buy an autonomous car and take it apart. Like, I don't, I don't have that kind of cash. I don't think most of us do. Um, so what are the opportunities for people who want to get into car hacking, want to get involved? You know, how does this community start to educate themselves about car, car hacking village? <laughs> There's the car hacking village. We also have a uh, SAE sponsors a auto cyber challenge. That's what it's called. And I went to that in August in Detroit. And, and in fact, four OEMs donated a car. You walk into a room like this. Um, and they had four cars set up, four different stations. And the kids were brought in. They were students from high school, really top-notch students from high school and from college. And they had the same folks that had actually presented at DEF CON. Uh, come in and black hat and teach them sort of how to hack the systems at, at a high level and then they let them have it, right? They give them like a whole night to, to hack it. And the um, manufacturers have their engineers there as well, so they're learning as well what, what, what can they do. And that was an incredible experience. So we have some areas where we can do that and I think you might have some other ideas that you're thinking about in that area. 
Well, yeah, I mean, those are great examples. And, um, you know, we're, we're growing our uh, exposure in the car hacking villages. Actually, we're going to be at uh, Grand Rapids GERCON here in, um, later this week, actually. And so that's going to continue growing. So if you guys go to those other you know, security conferences, whether they're in Las Vegas or regional, uh, you, you'll see uh, OEMs and GM and, and others, I think, in, in more ways. Um, but, you know, because we are on the platform, you know, that's a great way to interact with us as well. So, you know, even if you don't have a car, you know, you, you, there's things that you can look at, and apps and other things just to get started and, and start a conversation with us. And we talked a little bit earlier about, you know, that engagement between companies and, and the hackers. And I think it's been a, it's been a process for us just it, it, because obviously the guys on our team are human, but sometimes, you know, when you, when you start uh, having to have those interactions for the first time, um, you know, the, you're, you're trying to do it in a constructive way, and so you try to put some, you know, controls on that, but I think that can only, you know, go so far. So we're trying to make that more flexible, but I, we've had great interactions with, with people who um, reached out to us and told us about something, and maybe it wasn't even a specific vulnerability, but, hey, I, I really know all this stuff about my 2010 Camaro, and it's great, and I found that I can do this and that, and, you know, we've had phone conversations with, the, with those guys, and, um, you know, I think it's, it's a great opportunity to reach out to us, and if there's something interesting, you know, you never know what can happen. Um, I want to I take a quick poll of you guys out here. Um, how many of you are feeling really confident about cybersecurity of autonomous vehicles? Like, feeling good, you would put your kid in an autonomous vehicle and let it drive your kid off to daycare. <laughs> Things are going well. Braver than I am. No. Okay, okay. How many people feel like, medium about it. Like, you'd ride in it. You'd do it. <laughs> okay, medium. Okay. How many people feel bad about it? <laughs> like, really bad. <laughs> okay. So, so a lot of you guys seem like you want to get involved with car hacking, help fix the problem. That's great. Um, I, we're running a little bit low on time, but I know I have been told I have to leave time for you guys to ask questions. So... Do any of you have questions for our lovely panel? Hi. Um, I had a question about car-to-car -car communication. Um, I thought about it a, a bit, and there's a you know, paradox between, well, it's good, it'll help cars you know, avoid each other and so on, but also it's easy to spoof. You don't know if you can trust a random car from the road. Do uh, any of you have a, um, can, can you share your opinions about car-to-car -car communications? Yeah. Um, so actually, we call it car to car in Europe and V to V in the U.S., which is kind of funny. But um, so so V to V technology, uh, I agree. You know, it, when that first started, uh, there was a lot of concern, like you're mentioning. You know, how, how do you could you put, possibly masquerade as another car? Could you send erroneous data? Um, could you take a part out of a junkyard and you know start transmitting stuff? I mean, all those sort of cases uh, started coming up in in some of the advanced consortiums. So. Uh, v to V, as it's currently defined, actually has had years of thought put into it when it comes to cybersecurity. Now, is it you know it hasn't even launched, right? It actually hasn't even been mandated, mandated by the government yet um, because it's been delayed. So we're not even exactly sure when it's going to go live from a regulatory perspective. But that being said, there's been years of of work already put into it about how to manage the credentials. How do you uh, refresh those credentials on some rolling basis? How do you anonymize those? How do you anonymize the data, but then make sure that the data is authentic from you know one vehicle to another? So a lot of those have been considered, but um, uh, obviously it hasn't even gone live, and, and there's more to do for sure. When we were kind of talking a little bit earlier about um, whether or not autonomous vehicles would work the way cars work for us now, where I go out as an individual and buy a car, whether it's going to be mostly fleet-based things, like stuff that Uber is doing, stuff that Waymo is doing. Um, does that change that at all, if you're managing communication between cars that are in a fleet versus communication between individuals' cars just out on the road? Yeah, I think for a period of time it does. Um, you know, so, so if your product is a service and you're never buying a car, um, your interaction with that car is a little different. So if you look at, at things like the G-Pack, well, you know, they had the, the Jeep in their garage for eight months, right? You have a little bit more time to take things apart and figure that out. If your biggest exposure to a product is 25 minutes across town, um, the threat vector and, and interaction there is a little different. So, you know, we're thinking about those sort of things. But long range, you know, it, it, out in the future, are you going to buy an autonomous car? You, maybe. I don't know. I don't think anyone's figured all those business cases out yet. 
Okay, did I cut you off there? Oh, no, not at all. I, I, I was just going to make a mention that there's also the telecom companies, and by the way, one of them is a member of the Auto ISAC, who are also looking at this challenge, right? Because you're getting into some of the communications links. How does that look? And I think we talked earlier about GPS being still hackable and so forth. And so they're actually trying to design their strategy of what does that look like? You know, how secure are the communications between the vehicle to vehicle? And what does that design look like, right? So there's a lot of, um, I guess, elements that go into the strategy as we go forward. Yeah, I'll say one more thing. So, you know, there's a lot of discussion around connected cars and then autonomous vehicles and, you know, what's what. So um, really the way that we define it is, you know, vehicles today are connected vehicles, right? So we have OnStar, telematic services, and, and other things. So uh, the vehicles today are connected. Um, now, as you move towards autonomy, really the, the car doesn't change dramatically, right? You may, may add a few more telecommunication links, so you may have you know, multiple versions of that, and you obviously have a lot more computing processing uh, power that's, that's making a lot of decisions. So some things change, but you still have four wheels, and you still have computer-controlled systems, which you do today, and you're connected to you know, different systems in the back end, which are kind of like today. So um, yeah, it, it gets a little broader, but we don't really approach it differently. It's still uh, you know, looking at all the threat points, looking at it from a risk-based uh, approach, you know, trying to understand you know, what's the highest risk and how, you know, where to put security controls and, and things like that. Cool. All right. Questions? Hey. Uh, so oh, there's someone already has it. Who are you? Oh, okay. I see you. <laughs> I, uh, I'm, I'm really interested in what my wheel speed sensors have to tell me. But <laughs> I, I want to ask a question because I hear openness about um, how the companies are sharing information. Do you see, is, a, is ISAC going to be part of like a process to create an open standard for, say, like improving CAN bus or those other internal networks that are in cars? Or is, 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 that, an, is that an option? So, so the ISAC is not a standards body, just like we don't do policy. So we would not be the body that would do the standards development. What we are doing is developing best practices right now. And we're leaving it, many of the, our members are, are um, members of the standards body that would develop something like that if it would happen. Yeah, exactly. So I mentioned SAE um, and ISO. So there's, there's work going on in both of those bodies to, uh, and actually AutoZar as well, if you're familiar with that, which is a um, software standardization platform out of Europe, uh, basically for standardizing automotive uh, application layer and maybe a little bit of a network layer. Um, diagnostic layer t type of um, uh, functions in the vehicle. Um, they've been redefining ways to secure network security and CAN for years. Uh, and also in SAE, we're working on um, standards for securing the DLC port or the OBD2 port, if you're familiar with that. So that work's underway. Um, some of that's already been published. Some of that's going to be coming out soon. And so those things are then, I think, probably brought back to the ISAC where OEMs can talk about them, talk about, you know, how they're going to adopt it or if there's any issues and things like that. But that work's occurring in other forums. So, right. so it's going to be like a public, uh, is it a public forum or is it public standards that are released? Can we can we hope to see like yeah those standards are I mean you may have to you become a member or something yeah. but it's all public buy them. public space yeah once they're developed yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, thank you mm -hmm. all right um, hi oh oh there we go hi how's it going uh, so vehicle require uh, vehicle manufacturers currently have requirements for crash avoidance crash worthiness uh, and they have to build this into the cars do you think similar requirements for cybersecurity are unavoidable in the near future. When you say requirements, do you mean regulations or requirements within the OEM? Uh, regulations, where like, you can't sell a car without anti-lock brakes. You would not be able to sell a car that doesn't do something specific in the realm of cybersecurity. Yeah, I'm not sure uh, at what point that comes into play. I mean, the Self-Driving Act in, uh, in the autonomous space is probably our first uh, purview into that, where there are some regulations around cybersecurity and uh, what needs to be there for autonomous. It's pretty high level right now. so. There's a chance for that. Uh, you know, the way that we're approaching it at GM is we have requirements um, on ourself uh, in our, our highest level, uh, vehicle level uh, spec that basically says it has to meet these certain things from a cyber perspective. And, you know, that's what, how we're approaching it for now. Well, if NIST makes recommendations for cybersecurity, th are those, those are binding, right? Or They're not regulatory. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, did you still have a question? 
there's a person down here that has been trying very hard to ask a question. Awesome, thank you. Um, I was having a great time, except I have a 2011 Camaro, uh -oh. and so now I'm like sweating in my, in my chair. <laughs> I like how you have your flask out there, too. <laughs> If this is being recorded, this is um, like mostly water. <laughs> mostly. <laughs> mostly water, yeah. Actually, it's water with a little fruit in it. Um, so you mentioned, um, was it called Hacking Village or Auto Village? What was the? Yeah, Car Hacking Village. Car Hacking Village, uh, which is like a controlled hacking challenge. Um, and you mentioned uh, maybe a customer would try hacking on their own vehicle, maybe. Um, have you? Do you have plans or thoughts on unreleased uh, products? Like you have a system that is not yet uh, for sale in a vehicle, but maybe that component is ready to go. Maybe it's waiting on the rest of the car. Um, do you guys have thoughts about just the, the difficulties involved in, in opening that up? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, so great question. Um, I think it depends on the scope and the scale of, 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 of that. So. Yeah. Like I mentioned earlier, we might be able to take a specific component that hasn't been released yet and, and run it through some sort of private program when it, where it's kind of self-contained. Um, so I think those are options for sure. If it gets to an entire vehicle, that gets much more challenging and, and really we have to try to keep that within our scope of you know, our proving grounds because there's safety requirements and other things. Uh, so typically, you know, we, we have, even if we have third parties come in doing pen testing, we're doing that on our facility, um, you know, at our, at our closed sites for a lot of reasons. So, um, you know, some of that stuff we're, we're going to try to work through, but some of it's harder. So we haven't answered everything yet. So, yeah. Cool. All right. I think we could do maybe one more. Who has a really good question? Oh, oh already selected. Okay. Do you, have a good. Plan, do you have a plan about software update? So, you know, in the mobile ecosystem, uh, you know, there's a lot of challenges around pushing updates from, uh, you know, through various steps of the value chain. So, and with the sort of longer product lifetimes that you have in the automotive space, seems like that's going to be even more of a problem. Do you have thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, and it's you know, maybe something that we just have to design for. So today, um, we can obviously update our mobile apps that interface to the vehicle, and we can update our telematics units on our vehicles uh, generally, and we've been doing that for several years. Um, I think what you're going to start seeing is across the industry is more pervasive over-the-air update capability is what we call it. Um, so starting with maybe infotainment systems and then I'd say over the, over the near term more and more pervasively in the vehicle platform so that um, not only are we able to react faster to quality issues or uh, safety related issues but then also be able to do security patching. So um, I think you'll see that across the industry pretty soon. Cool. Securely. I heard scary over there, so oh. <laughs> obviously we're, we're heavily involved in making sure that that's a secure process. <laughs> um, so with more interconnected vehicles, you have more and more data uh, on the people who drive these vehicles. Um, how do you feel the auto industry will deal with protecting that privacy uh, and potentially when the time comes when law enforcement, be it federal or local, asks for that information. How, what will you do as you deal with potential users? And I'm asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> that was well, this is a really good question, right? Did you, Faye, do you have anything to say on it? Well, there's, let's see, a minute and 47 here, so. <laughs> I'll find you during. <laughs> so I, I may need a beer to answer that, but it's a, it's a great question. Um, I, I, I think there, there's a lot of pieces to that, right? You, you brought up the privacy aspect of it. You brought up. Um, you know, several different components of, of the space. And I think we're still learning, right? So obviously, we have a, a strong commitment to privacy today and, and tomorrow. Actually, our, our chief counsel for, um, for cybersecurity is also our, our chief counsel for privacy. So we work very closely to understand, you know, what we need to protect. And then our team comes in to help, you know, with how, how to protect it, right? So we work hand in hand from that perspective. Um, but, you know, exactly how all that changes, you know, we're, we're still facing a lot of these new things for the first time in terms of what the data is and, you know, who's collecting it and what, what you can do with it. So I'd say the answer to that is still uh, kind of TBD. <laughs> but I think the industry, other industries have, have shown some leadership in that area, I think, to answer your question. And I'm sure that the automotive industry will look at what others have done. And if you look at Europe, privacy is a big deal, right? And so they're actually implementing rules that are really a lot more stringent than here. 
But I think you're going to see that shift, and I think it's going to take a little time. Do you think that the ISAC might make some of those privacy recommendations for the group, or is that, again, getting into that area? Get, getting really into policy, okay. yeah. I, I think we might have a united voice is the most that we would do, but, uh, you know. Yeah, there's, there's already privacy principles that we've attested yes. to as an OEM, so, and others have as well. So it's definitely an important topic, um, but you know, more to come. Mm -hmm. Cool. Good um, question, though. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> right. All right, I think we're done. Can we get a round of applause for these guys? Thank you. Thank you.